On January 23, 1959, 10 Russian students with a passion for mountaineering embarked on a journey to the Ural Mountains. Their plans were quite simple, to traverse the challenging conditions of the Ural Mountains on pre-drawn routes and return. However, they were unaware that their journey would mark the beginning of an unsolved mystery for 64 years, leading to the horrifying loss of their lives. Only one person returned from the journey that day, and it took months to locate the remaining nine students' bodies. Some of the students had missing tongues or eyes, fractures, signs of beating, and radiation burns were detected on their lifeless bodies. What kind of journey could lead to such outcomes? This incident, occurring during the Cold War era, raised hundreds of unanswered questions in the minds of the paranoid society of that time. Had the students witnessed something they were not supposed to see? Were they subjected to a UFO sighting, a nuclear weapons test, an otherworldly entity, or an attack by the local indigenous people in the area where they were camping? Families who had lost their children were eager to know the truth. What kind of journey could lead to such tragic outcomes for their children? The only answer the families received was, you will never learn the truth, so stop asking questions. What transpired on that mountain? What is the truth behind the Dyatlov Pass incident? Before the video, if you subscribe to the channel, you will make me really happy. Now we can continue the video. Everything began with the plan of 10 students passionate about mountaineering to embark on a journey to the Ural Mountains during the semester break. These young individuals, studying at the Ural Technical University and keen on mountaineering, were not new to such adventures. Most of them were experienced and bold, having previously faced challenging conditions. Their common ground was the interest in mountaineering club at school. The first member of the group, Yuri Nikolaevich Derenko was a radio engineering student at Ural Technical University and became famous for bravely fending off a large bear with a hammer during a mountain trip organized by the club. The youngest member of the group, Ludmila Alexandrova Dubinina, was also a Ural Technical student. Studying engineering and economics, Ludmila was a brave and adventurous girl with a keen interest in mountaineering. When she was shot in the leg by a hunter during a trip to the eastern Sion Mountains in 1957, she remained calm, patiently waiting for the pain to subside without screaming. The leader of the team, Igor Dyatlov, also studied radio engineering at the same university as his friends. He was a highly successful engineer, and his engineering prowess was complemented by his passion for mountaineering. In his second year at university, he designed a radio for the Scion Mountains trip, which Ludmilla also joined. Among the group known for their intelligence and bravery, the second most mysterious figure, in my opinion, was Alexander Kolevitov, also a student at Ural Technical University. Studying physics, Kolevitov was a different and highly successful student compared to others. He was so successful that, Immediately after graduation, he began working at a secret institute in Moscow. His salary exceeded that of an average Soviet citizen, and he lived for free in an apartment where many distinguished scientists resided in Moscow. Kolevitov, who achieved all this at the age of 19, was also interested in mountaineering. He had climbed Mount Sabla, a very difficult mountain, not with a university mountaineering group like his other friends, but with a group of scientists working in secret Soviet nuclear facilities. Therefore, Kolevitov's past raised questions about whether there was a reason behind his participation in this journey, filled with secrets, or if it was merely driven by his passion for mountaineering. Grup's courage and fearlessness were embodied by another member, Alexandra Kolmogorova. Studying radio engineering at Ural Technical University, Alexandra was bitten by a poisonous snake during a journey with the university's mountaineering club, yet she continued the trip. She carried her load without letting anyone else help her, earning her the nickname, the university's locomotive. Another member of the group, Yuri Alexievich Kravanko, shared the group's passion for mountaineering and was an experienced individual. He had participated in eight different mountain journeys, leading four of them. Yet another member, Rustam Vladimirovich Slobodin, was also a student at Ural Technical University. 
Known for his athletic build and bravery, Rustam was a skilled mountaineer who had led one of the five journeys. Another member in the group, Nikolai Vladimirovich the Bobrignol, was recognized for his energy, athleticism, and academic success with a GPA of 4.15. The most mysterious member of the group was Semyon Alexievich Zolotaryov, a former commando and World War I veteran who had worked for the KGB. Zolotaryov had conflicting information about his past, name, age, and profession, even claiming to be 15 years older than the others. Zolotaryov, a man with no common connection such as age or school with the group, had joined six different mountaineering expeditions. Embarking on the journey with the young students despite his experience as a seasoned soldier who had fought for the KGB in Soviet Russia for years. What was his purpose there? Zolotaryov's presence and the lies he told about himself raised significant questions when evaluated alongside the other students with KGB backgrounds in the group. Perhaps the luckiest member of the group was Yuri Yudin, a student at Ural Technical University and a successful mountaineer who, due to a health issue during the journey in the Ural Mountains, had to return, becoming the sole survivor of the group. The area they were planning to traverse was not sufficiently researched. One of the mountains on the routes was named by the local Monsi people as Monsi Holet Siati, meaning Death Mountain, and there was a reason for that. However, the young adventurers were determined. The group leader, Igor, successfully managed to create a route for this under-researched area with the help of a pilot and a geologist. The group departed on January 23rd at 2105 with the Eslozen train and arrived at Serov train station at 739 on the morning of January 24th. They departed with the Serdin 81 train at 1847 and reached Ivdol at 2342 that evening. After spending the night at the Yiv train station, they arrived in Vey village at 7 o'clock in the morning with the Gas 51 bus. Before embarking on the journey that would determine their fate, they sent their last letters to loved ones and families at 10 o'clock on the morning of January 26th. After Igor Dyatlov returned, he mentioned that he would send a telegram to the UPI Sports Club about their return, but unfortunately, that telegram was never sent. At this point, Team member Yudin fell ill, but he continued the journey. At 13.10, they left with a gas 63 without functioning brakes and reached the forest of Zone 41 around 16.30. Yudin's condition was deteriorating, but he was determined to continue. From Zone 41 onward, they continued the journey with horses and wrote down some sentences in the Monsi language, the local language of the region they were heading to. They traveled from Zone 41 to the Ik North Settlement with horses, but Yudin's condition worsened. Due to sciatic nerve inflammation on his back, Yudin decided to turn back, and the group continued the journey with nine members. On January 28th, the group left Ik North Settlement, and the real journey began. When the date showed January 29th, they crossed the Osp River. They stopped every 70 minutes, following traces of local folk rhymes and continued their journey. They set up camp, slept, and on the morning of January 30th at 8.30, they continued their journey by following Monsi symbols. The journey was getting increasingly challenging, and they had to take longer breaks. In the mountain, the wind was blowing from all sides, causing a piercing cold on the faces. Clouds were descending, obscuring visibility in this dangerous weather, and on February 1st, they set up their tents in a perilous location. They had climbed quite high, and to avoid descending and losing the way, they pitched their tents in a dangerous area. However, no news was heard from them afterward. On February 12th, when the expedition should have been completed, the telegram that they were supposed to send to the sports club was never sent, but nobody worried. Because on previous trips, the same group had returned late. However, after a full eight days passed, on February 20th, the families could no longer resist their concerns and inform the authorities. A search team composed of volunteer students from the university was sent to the region. The research team, one month after the students went missing, could only find their tents. Inside the tent, there were still working flashlights, backpacks, and boots. 
Another strange finding about the tent was that it had been cut open from the inside. While contemplating what could have caused this, even stranger things were discovered. Footprints were identified just outside the tent. These were the footprints of the young campers. Some were barefoot, some wore socks, and some had boots on. The footprints disappeared suddenly 10 meters away. On that day, what happened, and how Yuri Kravenko found their bodies were as follows. Yuri had shockingly torn off his own finger joints with his mouth while in a state of shock. Both were half-naked. Although Igor had clothes on, he had no shoes, and he lay face down, hugging a birch tree branch. Near Igor, Zita's body was found. He was positioned as if he wanted to climb to the top of the hill where the tent was, with an ice axe. There was a long red mark on the right side of his body, as if he had been hit with a stick. Although the cause of death was recorded as hypothermia and freezing, it was thought that these could not be solely attributed to hypothermia. On March 5th, the body of team member Rustam Slobodin was found. He had a head injury. Three months later, the other four bodies were found. Nikolai's skull was glowing, and Alexander's neck was turned upside down. Ludmila and the mysterious member SEO had multiple broken ribs. SEO had an open wound on the right side of his skull. Both Ludmila and Kravenko had radiation detected on them. What happened at night remained a mystery. In 2019, the Russian prosecutor's office reopened the case. Prosecution spokesperson Alexander Sino stated that they did not take the murder scenario seriously. He mentioned that there was not a single piece of evidence. Avalanche, falling solid mass of snow, or storm could be possible, but these were just theories. More than 70 theories were narrated, but more work was needed to understand the truth. After this incident, Alexander Puzrin, a geotechnical engineer at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and avalanche simulation expert Johann Gom decided to investigate the case. They modeled the local terrain of Didatlov Pass in a computer environment, calculating the friction values and slope angles created by the snow. When all this data was compared with the fact that the youngsters could be wrong, they came to the conclusion. Igor Dyatlov's only study on the route was done through a local geologist and a pilot. This was a journey made as a result of inadequate research, leading the youngsters to make a mistake. However, these models alone were not enough to prove this claim. To answer this question, Puzrin and Gom consulted meteorological forecasts. According to meteorological predictions from the FAV Observatory in St. Petersburg, they assumed that a small avalanche could occur, covering the tent with about 1.5 meters of snow, and the wind would blow at a speed of 25 miles per hour. However, the question of how it could cause such traumatic effects on their bodies was still unanswered. Can an avalanche break ribs or a skull? To answer this question, they consulted an expert who worked on the realism of snow animations. The expert suggested using a realistic snow model for avalanche simulation to simulate the effects of avalanches on the human body. At this point, they remembered the crash test conducted by General Motors on cadavers to test the effects of car accidents. These tests were conducted to obtain data on how bodies leaning against a support with a certain mass and speed reacted to an object that collided with them. When all this information was combined, they realized that a heavy snow block of 16 meters could easily break the ribs and skulls of sleeping individuals on a hard bed. These findings suggested that the incident could not be explained by a simple avalanche. However, in addition to these questions, there were a few more unanswered questions, the burn marks and radiation on their bodies. According to Puzrin and Gom's findings, the burn on the body of Igor could be explained very simply. Those from the team who had radiation detected on them were actually among those sent to clean up the Sinin disaster, one of the world's largest nuclear accidents, which occurred exactly two years before the Didatlov Pass incident. The radiation traces on them explained it. The cutting of the tent from the inside could be explained by their desire to quickly cut it and get out to avoid being killed by the collapsing tent during the avalanche. Although we cannot know what happened there, at the end of the day, we believe that science provides answers based on solid evidence. This unfortunate camping site and avalanche, 
along with the unforgettable nature of Didatlov Pass, became an event that satisfied people's stubborn skepticism and curiosity for mystery. However, regardless of scientific findings, the tendency to generate new theories never stops.